I would like to acknowledge and greatly thank all the people behind the scenes and the organizing committee for all of their amazing efforts. I would also like to greatly thank our incredible speakers for making this event come together for us all. And thank you to all those who are in our attendance this evening. Before we continue with the program, a few quick reminders. Please make sure you are muted if you're not speaking. During the Q&A session, please do use the raised hand function, which you can find just at the bottom of your Zoom. You're also welcome to write your questions in the chat. Lastly, there will be an opportunity for networking at the very end of this event. So if you wish to participate in this, you are very welcome to stay on after our closing statement. Thank you to everyone. I will now hand it over to Rachel. Thank you, Dorothy. Good day, everyone. My name is Rachel Bone Pittman, and I have the privilege to serve as Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA. I too would like to welcome everyone and thank each of you for participating. While we come together from different regions of the world and while the effects of the climate crisis may show up differently where we live, the threat to the planet is the same everywhere. We are all feeling the negative impact in some shape or form, be it floods, droughts, hurricanes, or rising oceans. We are here today because our understanding of what's at stake is vital. Today's discussion will give us the opportunity to have real dialogues, learn from one another, and exchange ideas. While world leaders were called to action at COP27, we cannot leave it up to them alone. So let us find new ways to work together as a global community to address the climate crisis. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said at the high level opening of COP27, human activity is the cause of the climate problem. So human action must be the solution. Let's all be the solution. Thank you. And I'd like to turn it over to Tita Banks. I'm so sorry, Tita, you're on mute. There we go. I did it. Okay, so welcome everyone and a special welcome uh, from UNA uh, Scotland, UNA House, uh, UNA USA, and I'm bringing welcome from the uh, World Federation of United Nations Associations with members from over 100 nation chapters and some of whom we have joining us today on our panel and in our audience. Our event today will focus on the outcomes of COP27 in relation to the outgoing, up, out, ongoing energy crisis and bring to focus people's lived experiences of the climate crisis. Moreover, it's an opportunity to take stock of what has been delivered at COP27 in line with our most recent post COP26 event. And some of you joined us last year for the COP26 sessions. We held two of those and the recordings and our outcomes of those sessions are available on our link. Today, we'll hear from our speakers representing uh, each of the five UN designated regions. As you noted, one of the regions um, is not formally being presented today, but they include Africa, Latin America and Caribbean, Asia Pacific, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe and others. The speakers we'll hear from today are Dr. Ali Kayei, from UNA South Africa, Amid Versace from Resilient Earth and SABS, um, Vladislav Kaiv from SG's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change and Youngo Green Jobs, Ray Brathwaite from UNA Trinidad and Tobago, and Himaja Nagaretti from the UNA USA. Thank you to all our guest speakers for being here with us today to share your invaluable experiences and expertise. This will be followed by a parallel and a panel and Q&A discussion session where you will all have an opportunity to raise questions to our speakers or prompt points of discussion. You may write your questions or comments in the chat box at any time during the event or use the raise hand function during the Q&A session. I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ali Kayayi from UNA South Africa. 
Ali serves as Executive Secretary General of the United Nations Association of South Africa since 2011 and is on the board of two business startups. He's also my colleague on the Executive Committee of the World Federation of UNAs. Through UNA South Africa, he advocates the role of societies taking responsibility of their own communities through the ideas of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So welcome, Ali. Tera, thank you so much for the, uh, for the welcoming. Um, dear guests, um, the host of the panel session, my honorable colleague, uh, Dr. Tera Banks and the team at the UN House in Scotland. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for organizing this panel discussion. Of course, with my other colleagues in their respective UNAs, uh, it's paramount that the UNAs increase their voice on the COP debate and that we should have a more robust statements shared with our delegations for the next COP28 in Dubai. So I hope that we could aim for that um, for the next COP. And usually the initial comments by my African colleagues um, across the COP conferences are that the greenhouse gas emissions from an African continent account for less than 4% of the global amount, which is the opening point where we commence our negotiations at the UNFCCC sessions. Um, however, as the poor continent, we have to deal with the most extreme weather patterns and attempt to mitigate such issues. Of course, the major problem on the continent, um, apart from instability in its government and its lack of resources, is the notion of food security and energy security and a poor infrastructure to support mitigation strategies. And these strategies are quite important in response to negative effects of climate change. And in the African continent, I think we have four regional blocks and each block is mandated specifically to reduce their carbon emissions, but also at the same time, increase their adaptations to the climate crisis. There was a review paper by Mark Andia in 2019, the needs for loss and damage, which is highly um, read in, in these uh, discussion points that expresses the dire need of around half a trillion year in funding for the African continents and its respective states to be able to increase their infrastructure emergency risk rescue services, the heavy industry and manufacturing sectors to become more resilient to the adverse effects of climate change. So in the outcome of 20, COP27, it was a bit positive on the, for the North for the continent, because I think with the spirit of implementation was, was, was advocated amongst the leaders and the delegates at the conference. And as the host nation was Egypt and in North of Africa, and such commitments were not going to be adhered to. It will be a big blow to the African co continent with the promises of, you know, multilateralism, which could be broken as financial and implementing partnerships are not just needed, but highly necessary, um, especially from the global north to the global south. And COP27 also emphasized the need for increased momentum to reform the um, developmental banks and international financial institutions and actually call on these institutions to take decisive actions to scale up climate finance next year, especially in the renewable energy space, as most of the greenhouse gases are from coal powered plants on the continent. Another avenue to assure that the continent would have some mitigation strategies, if these commitments by the global north are adhered to, and whom are most responsible for such anthropological climate change issues, was to gather business leaders on the African continent um, in a coalition, which is called the African Business Leadership Coalition. And these are basically private and semi-state business leaders who not just have the means, but also have lesser red tape to commit and assist the evolution of industry to better adapt to the climate crisis on the African continent. And these leaders are mostly from the energy space um, that actually have come together to manage these mitigation strategies. And these are actually some examples of where industry leaders are being invited to platforms to showcase their commitment and also to save face on the companies with regards to how they will manage the future with keeping uh, committee, commitment within the 1.5 degrees increase in temperatures. Additionally, um, having COP27 on, on being hosted by Egypt increased the commitments within the Marrakesh partnership, which included 14 commitments within the adoption, adaptation of the agenda and 24 commitments within the acceleration framework and 14 commitments for keeping reporting standards transparent and increasing the accountability, which is again, very important for the African continent as um, accountability is, 
seems to be a bit lacking on our on our governmental side, which I'll explain a bit later, what was happening in South Africa. Um, and from that Marrakesh partnership, they launched a, a Sharm el Sheikh adaptation agenda, known as SES, which was aimed to enhance resilience for 4 billion people living in most climate vulnerable communities by 2030. And, and of course, these ambitious targets, which, um, which shows the humanity side of these uh, conferences and, and you know it's aiming for four billion change is, is quite a high target but i believe that's the adaptation in renewable energy and its uh, security is very crucial to the african uh, for the survival of the african continent and i think personally i i think adaptation is the most critical for the continent to hold on to and since um my focus is on Africa and its vulnerabilities have been exposed and it's again for its lack of adaptability. And I think from the CES agenda, it included seven commitments, um, which also included a fund for African cities and their water crises. And I'll, I'm trying to hone on this conversation regarding the um, renewable energy regarding to water as um, the battle for water currently in the, you know, in the east and the northern parts of the continent is a bit of a battle between the East African states and North African states. And um, this is especially important in the hydroelectric power plants that have been um, being, being projected to be executed. And I think one, one case study is the one in Ethiopia, which um, currently it's already, Egypt is already um, pushing uh, to somehow limit the, the water input into that uh, project. Because uh, downstream of the of the Nile River could just <clears throat> um, actually damage 100 million inhabitants, and of course this will fuel tensions between member states um, that are sharing the Nile. Hence, the renewable energy situation in Africa is an open card for investments by the global north, as the continent does need power. And um, for example, as in South Africa, and we're having large industries in the country. We have welcomed um, loans and other supporting grants by the, by the Norwegians and the Germans and other industrial countries um, that are aiming to invest on the continent. But even though we have produced the least amount of greenhouse gases, we also been barred from financial support for major fossil fuel projects, which in turn begs the question on how sustainable this continent will be in the future while we become the playground, which I think it's we're becoming, for industrial nations, renewable energy companies to take on projects that would afford, you know, afford our people the energy that we need. So lastly, I just want to make clear that this climate and its development agendas are quite linked. And um, the way that the agendas are being um, pushed mostly are needs to be people people centric. That will deliver prosperity. Um, and how the African continent's um, progress is getting onto is honing onto more commercial commercialization of energy by the by the from the North South partnerships. But I hope that uh, that these you know partnerships actually builds more resilience. And I think post COVID nineteen pandemic, we now have a multitude of services that could you know serve the human needs and not actually hamper the human dignity that we. Uh, home in honing on to and i hope that these discussions we're having today or this evening from my side uh, we should more light on the african agenda and under and the climate change crisis handling since um, our systems of handling is elementary and our adaptations are need to be advanced to have a better life on the continent and lastly uh, while i'm uh, just sharing um, my time with you some experiences um, I, my last session with uh, with Teta um, of course in South Africa we're having major power outages and it usually happens while I'm while I'm in a in a talk power goes off so um, and it's becoming quite becoming so common that um, we actually have specific schedules so um, in, in a nice way you know companies shut down so you have more, more time off from, from from work which which is which is a good part but the negativity is that many industries shut down and the GDP lowers, um, essential services drop. And this is what, how we are actually currently living in, in the most industrialized country in Africa. 
So um, that was just my last point just to share of how we try to manage our um, energy crisis, which of course has been hampered with, um, the, the, is, is a multifactorial uh, problem. Um, but on the renewable energy side, it's, it's crucial that uh, countries and member states need to increase their um, tax incentivization for um, renewable energies, which will then allow commercialization of uh, more commercial commercialization of, of the industry towards um, lesser, lesser use of fossil fuels. And that was just my last point to share with you. Great, thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Lerke. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kiai for your insight and reflections on COP27 from the African continent's perspective. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm now delighted to introduce our next speaker, Amir Vasatje from Resilient Earth and SABS. Amir Vasatje is a keynote speaker, the director of Resilient Earth, and a consultant with Elite Coaching International, specializing in fitness, self defense, mental strength, strategy, and leadership. He has strong connections with Pakistan through his family background and continued relations here. And I mean, welcome. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for inviting me, Dr. Banks, uh, Dorothea, the rest of the, the team. Uh, it's a great privilege for, for me to be sharing this with you. Pakistan is in a very, very precarious position. What started off as a climate conversation became climate effect, climate change, climate emergency, and is now climate crisis. The stats are actually quite staggering. Recently, Pakistan has a large swathe of its land mass covered in water. 1,600 people have per perished and more are dying because of the waterborne diseases from the floodwaters. So we're now experiencing a period of a spread of malaria and diarrhea. Pakistan is a very resilient country, but it can't manage itself without foreign aid. It needs help from other countries. A recent European Union data poll said that Pakistan is one of the, is the eighth most vulnerable country to climate effect. It has a very large land mass and its southern ports are vulnerable to what potentially one day could become a tsunami. So it's imperative that the powers that be use the time with the COP conversations to not just highlight what needs to be done, but actually take the decisive steps because Pakistan is suffering from the effects of the floods, heating of the surface, which with, leads to drought. And in fact, there is a possibility of an impending famine. None of these can be coped by the Pakistani government all by themselves. What they have been doing is progressively trying to change their emphasis on fossil fuel usage to renewables. Currently, two thirds of their energy is via fossil fuels. And what they're hoping to do is use 60% from renewables in the coming time ahead. It's a very precarious situation. There is a loss and damage fund that has been created, I believe, from the, the last COP27. It's been very slow in coming and being put into practice. And I think Pakistan is one of those countries that uh, 
uh, is very much in need of the active participation in this climate, uh, this uh, loss and damage fund. What our foreign minister recently said was very startling that um, it's not something about the future, it's the land that we're standing on that we're trying to save. And that is actually, it's, it's, it's very, very saddening to think that, you know, that there are all these world projects that are on the go at the moment, but a country like Pakistan is suffering right this very moment because they can't manage by themselves. They need foreign aid and it's very slow in coming forward. Recently, the, the, the World Bank did give $100 million to a solar energy project uh, to Pakistan. And there is also the creation of a wind corridor in the southern coastline, all of which shows that Pakistan is doing its part to, first of all, protect itself and change towards more sustainable long-term projects. But once again, I have to emphasize that the damage that's been done by the recent floods would probably take years to recompense. And that is one of the disheartening things about the outcomes of COP27, that they will not be able to address those immediate needs of Pakistan, of the Pakistani nation. That's what's really required. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves elongating the suffering of the Pakistani people. 33 million people lost, were displaced by this flood. A million livestock perished. 1,600 people lost their lives. These stats are actually staggering. New loans, investment, and the loss and damage fund must come together to help with the rebuilding. I'm glad I'm able to share this with you today because someone has to speak up for what we refer to as the developing nations. And ultimately it's people paying with their lives and livelihoods. We must meet this with very powerful force because if the COPs just keep adding up last year, Glasgow COP26, this year, COP27 in Egypt, next year, I think it's uh, in the United Arab Emirates. And change is very slow. It takes time to, first of all, come to an agreement. Then it takes time to implement what was agreed. Meanwhile, entire nations are being affected. And that's something that we should really be addressing with a greater uh, matter of urgency. I'd like to conclude that Pakistan was created in 1947. And its founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, said at the time that the prosperity of this nation will depend entirely on maintaining the health of this nation, of its people, and taking care of the masses particularly the poor. And this is what he said in 1947, and this has become even more potent today. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Ami, for your deep, insightful comments um, on behalf of the Pakistani region. So our next speaker of the day is unable to join us but has sent him video sharing his thoughts and comments on COP27. So Vlada 
Vladislav Kim is a member of the Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change and Young Go Green. He is a young Moldova economist and climate action and sustainability advocate with vast experience at the UN level, as well as on multiple national and local platforms in the Eastern European region. His main fields of advocacy has been on green jobs for youth, just transition, green and sustainable economy growth, and reforms to the multilateral climate finance agenda. So we would now like to share a video. COP27, for me, like for many youth, was a very ambivalent experience. Unfortunately, we have seen that a lot of the agenda points that we needed to pass in order to see meaningful progress were obfuscated or held hostage to quite a significant extent. Add on top of that the fact that the, in general, the environment in which you had to operate, especially if you represent an NGO, or you are exercising an important observer function, or if you're also dealing with human rights, has been rather oppressive. Many youth experienced a lot of insecurity, starting from uh, simply material issues, like making sure that your check-in at the hotel is going all right, to the frustration with how the negotiations are going. That said, we still have one small but important win to clench, uh, is the loss and damage fund, of course, However, beware of uh, media and others touting it as a significant achievement and cause for celebration because the fund is only established in principle. The transitional committee that is supposed to actually set the rules for it is still not yet selected and not in session. And also we need to keep in, in our minds that the 1.5 degree language barely made it there. The fossil fuels language is still the same as in Glasgow. So there is still so much to do. There is still so much for us to cover in terms of the ground. But now we need to take stock of what happened, recognize that how important it is to set the course and not just to be snapped up by what we see going on in the media or in other sources. Set our own agenda. This is extremely important. And then, take care of ourselves and of each other because there is still a lot of climate fight to come especially in the year 2023 and COP28. Thank you to Vladislav for his valuable insights and reflections. I'm delighted to introduce to you our next speaker Mr. Ray Brettwith from UNA Trinidad and Tobago. Ray Braithwaite is the current president of UNATT and the former president of GCI, Senators of the Americas and Caribbean. He was also formerly the deputy chairman of Trinidad and Tobago Civil Aviation Authority. Welcome, Braithwaite, please carry on. Thank you very, very much for your kind invitation to participate in this very important discussion. Thank you, Dr. Banks, for your welcoming address and welcoming spirit to have me participate in this exercise. And to my fellow colleagues, Ali, Rifuna, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to spend a few moments with you. Um, the whole question of climate change is a worrisome matter. For me, planet Earth is in peril. And it is in peril because of man's action against mankind. And therefore, COP 27 and the future is an important initiative, but the question really is, do we have the will to make the changes necessary to save planet Earth? That will be a debate for a very long time. My country, Trinidad and Tobago has seen over the last two weeks, like Pakistan, 
some very unusual rainfall. We have had some flooding in areas never before. And the water levels took very long to run off. Because of the nature of our islands, uh, and, and it's the nature of small island development states, um, we operate on what we call high tides and low tides. So when the tide is high, the water stays on the land. And when it, the tide is low, it runs out to the sea. However, because of man's developmental urges, what was designed as the sponge, as the holding area, as the what is really officially called the wetlands, the swamps. We have had so much backfilling for industrial purposes that when we have the extra water, there's no sponginess to collect that water and therefore it becomes flood. And that's not only for Trinidad and Tobago, a lot of the islands of the region experience the same thing. But there's an aspect of the COP conference. I know that a lot of discussions were had about the dangers of fossil fluid and that, and that fossil fluid, which is coal, gas, and oil, are by far the largest contributor to global climate change, accounting for over 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and nearly 90% of all the carbon dioxide emissions. And as greenhouse gas emissions blanket the earth, they trap the sun's heat. Now, every time we talk about fossil fuel, um, fuels and carbon, um, carbon dioxide, et cetera, we tend to localize the thinking. But because of my civil aviation background, I want to plant the seed in the mind's eye that tongue in cheek, we had almost 75 private jets at COP this year, 75 or more. So there were 75 aircrafts contributing to greenhouse gases in the airspace. Now, local transportation do contribute far more than aircrafts with respect to greenhouse gases. But you see, the local transportation is localized. When an aircraft flies in the atmosphere, it flies in a, in a way that can do far more damage to the Earth's atmosphere than local transportation. And therefore, I just want to plant the seed that the discussion about climate change must go to aviation. If not, we will, we will not have the full coverage that we want. For Latin America, um, it is important that we look at what's happening with deforestation of the Amazon and the interference of of, of the, the zone through illegal mining. There are some environmental problems in Latin America that we need to pin, which is like industrial action, the use of toxic pesticides, the use of land for agricultural non-sustainable usage, logging, tourism, and other developmental activities that have produced environmental pollution in indigenous people's lands. And I, I want to underscore in indigenous people's lands in Latin America. Um, so given what I've said and given the time that you have allotted, I just want to wish to indicate that yes, fossil fuel fluid is the most, um, is the criminal, if you will say, as we look at planets Earth and its peril. But we also have some of those aspects of the fossil fuels that we hardly mention because of um, because of 
the nature of what it is. And therefore, I will leave with you today that let us expand climate change because it's really making a difference. I see in the United States of America from where we sit, we see strange weather patterns. We see in Central and South America, extremely strange weather patterns. And us in the Caribbean, even though we have a saliferous atmosphere and we enjoy the sea and the sun and the sun, we too are experiencing strange weather patterns can only be, which can only be attributed to climate change. And, and therefore, if it is attributed to climate change, it amplifies that planet Earth is in peril. And the question is, what can you and I do differently to make the difference? I salute you. Um, let's thanks Ray together for his insightful comments. So I'm now delighted to introduce our final speaker of the day, Himajo Negradi. So Himajo from, Act from Acton, Massachusetts, is a young um, UNA USA's youth observer to the United Nations. As a proud daughter of a South Indian immigrant, she currently serves as a health equity research fellow for the CDC and as a selected board member for her town. So let's welcome together Himaja. Thank you, Clara, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, I do have prepared slides. I'm gonna go ahead really fast and share my screen. All right. Um, and then I'll go ahead and start this. Can everyone see that? Excellent. Great, thank you. Um, so wanted to provide a few quick reflections, um, specifically focusing on the US priorities um, during this COP27. Um, it was really great to see a strong US presence at this COP. Um, and so I um, just wanted to take you all kind of through um, the four key priorities that our delegation had. So the first um, priority of note was um, bolstering global global climate resilience. Um, so our delegation um, worked to increase the US pledge um, to 100 million for the adaptation fund um, and allocate um, 150 million for the president's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience um, acronym PREPARE efforts in Africa. Um, PREPARE was actually um, one of the uh, big focuses of our delegation, really making sure that we we're providing funding and resources um, to help global efforts around adaptation and resilience, which we all can agree um, is a really important element um, of us sustainably and equitably addressing the climate crisis. The second priority that was um, noted was accelerating global climate action. Um, so we supported Egypt in their deployment um, of new wind and solar energy. We are making commitments to do that. Um, they And we're also working to help decommission um, current uh, wind and solar energy infrastructure that may not be as efficient as the technology um, has improved significantly. We've also worked to um, strengthen our own domestic methane regulations for oil and gas um, to decrease them by 87% as of 2005 levels. Um, and this is part of the Global Methane Pledge, which is something important to flag. This is um, a pledge that um, many countries around the world um, are looking into to see how we can um, be more stringent about uh, reducing methane emissions, which um, significantly um, contribute to climate change. And we also um, were the first to require or are working to be the first to require major suppliers to set the Paris Agreement um, aligned emissions reduction goals in all of our efforts. So every time we reach out to a major supplier, this would be um, one of those key criteria that we look for as a country um, before making that commitment, which I think um, will very much uh, set a good precedence uh, moving forward um, for really being uh, more green about our choices um, and advancing climate change action in everything that we do. 
The third um, priority that was noted was catalyzing large scale investments um, to tackle the climate crisis. Um, I say this with the caveat that I am not a finance person. <laughs> so I really did have to do my research on this um, and still I'm am, am trying to understand it. But um, from what I gather, um, supporting developing countries um, and it is really critical um, to advancing a total green economy, which is one thing that we wanna be moving forward into. So um, committing to using public financing from the US standpoint is important for us um, to continue to advance private sector investments um, and mobilization of billions um, in the right direction. And so these are some of the sub bullets um, some of the key points that were listed, I'm um, supporting developing countries and issuing green bonds, um, launching the Sustainable Banking Alliance for um, sustainable finance markets, and investing, um, again, to mobilize um, private financing, um, and also thinking about um, exporting U.S. clean technologies um, to kind of help aid in that global effort. And then the fourth one, um, the fourth priority that was listed was engaging everyone to tackle the climate crisis. Um, so the US uh, launched the Climate Gender Equity Fund, Indigenous Peoples Finance Access Facility, um, and have started new exchanges to empower youth leaders in resilience and clean energy. Um, all of which are steps in the right direction. Um, but uh, one thing that I'll end with, um, because I'm at the end of my presentation, um, is that as Youth Observer to the UN um, in this space, one of my key priorities was really listening to young people on the ground. So I was speaking with young people, conducting interviews, um, really getting to listen and hear their thoughts as to what we need to be doing better as a country, as a world, to advance our efforts to combat the climate crisis. And most young people mentioned the importance of their representation in these spaces. It was really great to see young people in the blue zone, for example, but many who were in the green zone weren't able to access these negotiation spaces and talk with their delegations um, if they didn't even have the access to do so. Many young people tried to come to COP, um, but were unable to do so um, because they weren't able to find a badge um, either week one or week two. Um, many young people, even while in Egypt, um, similar to what was said before, had difficulty navigating the system um, with, uh, in, in many ways, little support. And so I think that when we talk about youth representation, it's about how do we collectively use our privileges to break down barriers so that more young people can not only be in this space, but be valued in this space. And so that's, that's really the key thing that I took away from really listening to young people. Um, but I think that um, you know it, it also goes beyond that. When we talk about representation, are we adequately addressing gender representation? Are we talking about indigenous people's representation? I met one, uh, I met two refugees um, at COP27, two young refugees. And they told me that they had been at COP for the entire two weeks and had not met a single other refugee with them. And we all know that climate refugees should be at the table. They're the ones that are at the forefront of the climate crisis. So really, you know, thinking about how are we engaging everyone because we need everyone's voices to tackle the climate crisis. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Imogen, for outlining the US's priorities during COP and for also emphasizing the importance of engaging with youth. Um, and thank you again to all of our speakers who've joined us today for your insightful comments. Um, we will now be moving on to the panel discussion and Q&A section of the event. So I would like to invite all participants today um, to write any questions or comments in the chat box. I've noticed we've had a few discussion points in the chat box already. Thank you so much to those who have put them in. Um, I would like to invite them to elaborate further after our questions. Um, so shortly after our questions. Um, and while we wait for questions from participants to come through, um, I would like to start with one question that we as the organizing committee um, would like to ask our speakers. Um, and that would be, 
What proposal or action discussed at COP27 is a promising solution or action to be implemented that will positively impact your geographic region? Um, so I wonder if Ali, if you would like to start. Sure, thank you so much. I think I, I did touch on some points regarding um, the Sharm El Sheikh um, um, adoption agenda, which which was something new that that came out of the COP twenty seven Congress conference, and that I think was was quite pertinent because it was uh, the Egyptian um, leaders push to have a have a more of a commitment agenda um, for the African continent um in the cop conferences because I, I think ray also mentioned we move from cop to cop or um and every year the 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 process is slow to adopt such such uh negotiating partners and from that um sharm el sheikh uh, adaptation agenda i think it will be if, if it's if it is if it is fully committed by the the those who've who've agreed upon it was was something positive for the for our I think for the whole continent um, and the next thing which I'd also touch point on was the African leaders African business leaders uh, coalition that was formed which will in a way mitigate if those commitments aren't served by those who are aiming to serve us especially the 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 North South partnerships then the African business leaders could actually step in and they're also aiming to also commit. So it's becoming a multi-pronged commitment approach for the uh, people of the continent via the governments and of course, business leaders. So I think the, the, these two points was quite important for the con continent to, to uh, acknowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali, for the elaborating. I wonder if any of the other speakers would like to come in. Amit, yes. I think the loss and damage fund uh, was something that was very late in coming. Uh, 30 years, developing countries have been requesting financial aid. And I think there's now an agreement in principle to set up something, although the contributors and the amounts are still to be established. And I think COP27 at least penciled in something that will now contribute part of the regeneration of countries that are either have lost or are in need of financial aid. And I think that's something very important going forward, that the countries that currently have experienced trouble, floods, famine, monsoon rains, damage to their infrastructure are now to be supported because I think there was a, rel a reluctance in, in times gone by to actually make the financial commitment and I think that's been a, a very positive step albeit that it's still to be set up and impl Im 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 implemented fully. Thank you so much Amid. I wonder if Ray or Himaja if you would like to give your thoughts? obviously there's absolutely no pressure to um but i'd like to give you the opportunity if you would like to i'll um chime in really fast um to say i agree with what everyone said um i think that um the progress on loss and damages was really um was really great to see especially because that had been in the works for decades that had been something that advocates had been really pushing for for a really long time um but exactly like was mentioned before it's not um, the end all be all. Um, the other thing I will mention that uh, was uh, good to see was the youth representation. We had our first children's and youth pavilion. We had young people, um, more young people being um, chosen as a part of their delegation um, for their countries. And so we're actively part of not only just the discussions going on at COP27, but all of the prep work before that and are now going to be involved in the aftermath of that. And I think that's probably one of the most important things to note is that COP27 is really just a two week conference. Um, countries put their best foot forward, hopefully trying to figure out how we can keep 1.5 alive, how we can keep 
um, our planet safe and protected um, and, and not further these damages. Um, but so much of the work happens before and after that. And having young people and people who have been historically um, underrepresented in these spaces, but who face the brunt of the climate crisis involved in these steps, I think is so critical. And so continuing to push for that representation um, will be key. Great. Thank you, Himaja. Um, Ray, I believe you, I may be mistaken, but I believe you unmuted at one point. I don't know if you would like to come in. Um, yes, thank you. I support the points of view expressed. But from where I sit, I'm challenged by the lack of enforcement. Oftentimes we have excellent intention. We sit down and we model what the possibilities can be. And then by the time we have COP, 28, we are still wondering what we have achieved. So my, my, my biggest challenge is enforcement. Um, those things that we make obligations to do and to make sure that they happen. If that doesn't happen, then planet Earth will continue to be in peril. Great, thank you so much, Ray. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, in the interest of time, I noticed we have two um, two questions. So I'll read those two questions back to back um, and invite speakers to answer either both or one of them. Um, that's completely up to you. And then we'll move on um, to two people I believe have put in discussion points. So we'll hear from them before moving to our closing statement. Um, but if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to keep putting them in the chat and we will save them um, to include, to include um, in our follow-up emails. Um, so the first question here from Joseph Baxter, what is the shift in consciousness or parameters that is needed to make progress for COP28? And we have a question from Wabi Isaac. Uh, there seems to be a lack of enforcement and authority in pushing countries to cut their emissions as this is hinged on individual countries' self-will to act. How can countries be pushed to feel the need to act as opposed to being self-driven and self-motivated? Would anyone like to come in on that? Yes, Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I think on just on the uh, on the first question on the parameters of consciousness, I believe from the previous pandemic, um, which I was quite heavily involved in uh, as a heavy frontliner in the middle of the of the pandemic, the the shift in people's behavior was was through crisis. Number one. Number two, so the, the shift in consciousness has to happen on when, when a crisis occurs. And I think the issue with climate change is a very subtle, gradual, slow change. And you don't actually feel it until it comes to you. So, so that to, to e either, either you have to tackle the consciousness question on, from that front, or we have to manage it on the physical uh, realm, which, which begs to the notion of, you know, taxing or monetary or commercialization and um, if if we wish to create changes within within cop 20 which i just i explained also i just touched upon it is that like for example in south africa the push for renewable energy is becoming much more incentivized for um, the local um, power production companies number one number two taxation on your carbon emissions is also increasing so large uh, corporates that are managing thousands of thousands of people, which in turn uh, affect their lives, these mitigation strategies on you know, carbon taxation or incentivizing using non-fossil fuel uh, suppliers, et cetera, actually incentivizes the push for more uh, renewables and less uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So these, these uh, um, it's, it's like a carrot, carrot and, and a stick approach which I think would, would be a, a method of shifting the consciousness of, of, of societies to actually understand that they need to move. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ali. Uh, Amit, would you like to come in? Yes, it was just reinforcing that uh, what Ali said there, that uh, mitigation is is very important. However, implementation of, you know, it's very difficult to convince developed industrialized nations to cut back on something that is their entire economy is dependent on the, the change is gradual. It's, it can't be sudden. However, if we can at the very least time scale it to some extent, that by certain dates we must be reliant on less fossil, more renewable, and maybe quite specific about it and not be very vague. Because in the past times gone by, because we're vague about dates for implementation of uh, various strategies, countries tend to just trundle along in their own personal existence and uh, gases are emitted, the temperatures are rising, sea levels are rising as the result of a slow progress. So I think if we offer incentives for people to change and also encourage developing countries to do their part in the overall process of shielding themselves better by giving them financial incentive to protect themselves and, and make greater use of renewable energies, I think that would be also quite useful. So the two-pronged approach, get the industrialized nations to cut back, but give specific time scales and support the developing nations in their quest to make change. Great, thank you, Amid. Uh, Himaja, Ray, would you like to give your thoughts on this? If not, I will, I will simply say that what gets punished is avoided and what gets rewarded is encouraged. And therefore, if there is not an incentive system in place for the change required, it will stay as is. The move to renewable energy should be a high point because we do have all the resources available across the world for renewable energy, water, wind as examples, raw materials. We do have it. It is how do we in create incentives for people to move in those directions, especially when the industrial nations um, develop their whole culture and economics around those current offensive energies that we use. And if I may add very fast as um, a last word, so much of our ability to advance climate commitments on the national level um, is based on the political will of our leaders. And so, you know, noting, you know, that UNAUSA is a nonpartisan org, um, you know, just making sure that when we're navigating these environments or when we're using our power as voters, that we're really making sure that our elected leaders are actually committed to advancing human rights. Um, and one of them being, being able to live in a safe and clean and healthy environment, you know, making sure that our leaders know that that is a priority for you as a voter and is a priority for other people who are voting, um, whether it's, you know, during presidential elections or even local elections, it really does matter. Um, and that political will is absolutely critical for any type of this change to happen. And so it's really important for us to keep that in mind. And also communication is key, um, making sure that when we're talking about the science of things or when we're talking about the technical aspect um, of policies, that we're really making sure that we're effectively communicating to people about that, because it's all about how we can bring everyone to the table together. And that requires everyone to have access to that knowledge and to spaces of decision making um, where they feel like their voices are valued and genuinely are um, given priority. Thank you so much. Um, I am very aware we are running slightly over time. Um, thank you everyone so much for taking the time.
um, to be here with us. Uh, before I pass on to um, Herb to share what his UNA is doing on creating solutions for climate change, I'd just like to highlight um, Denny's comment on neighborhood town meetings, Samuel's comment on transitioning from hydroelectric power to other sources of energy forms, um, Aisha's question um, on shifting mental models to mobilize locals, as well as Steve's question on the world UNA's post-COP. Uh, I've made a note of all of those comments and questions, um, and that will be included in the follow-up to this event. Um, so if anyone else has any questions or comments, please feel free to keep putting them in the chat. Um, and I'd like to now invite Herb to um, talk to us on his what his UNA is doing on creating solutions regarding climate change. Herb, are you yeah, there? thank you. I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good, great. Um, I'm actually not talking about my chapter. I'm talking about what you said in the introductory remark, what UNA can do. People so far have been talking about what our governments can do, what the COP can do and everything else. But there's been a growing awareness and an alarm, of course, among all of us who are on this call and elsewhere about the impact of climate change and what's happening now. It's not something in the future. Secondly, there's a lot of uh, discomfort and frustration about the amount that's been achieved at the COPs. And thirdly, we're quite concerned in the United States about whether there will be the continuity and the commitments building upon what our Congress adopted last year. But now we're anticipating, of course, a change in our administration, in our Congress. So uh, we're concerned. So 20 of our chapters in California and Hawaii took an unprecedented step to say, let's us all get together to both inform our members to address their alarms, to build more solidarity among what UNA can do, and to involve them through better information and advocacy. So it was very much practical what we can do. We have had so far four programs, three before and after last year's COP, and one before the COP this year, COP 27. Uh, last year, we, we focused especially on the problems and expectations of what was gonna happen at the COP, what we wanted the UN to do. There were over 350 people, including quite a few youth who were involved in the three programs we had last year. Uh, the third one we had was after the Wafuna uh, meeting that uh, UNA in Scotland and, and Wafuna organized. But this year, prior to COP27, uh, we again said, hey, we've got to do better. We've got to encourage greater collaboration and local takeaways of uh, what we can do. So we've involved uh, in the last years, including in September, a lot of NGOs, politicians from the presidential candidates, governors, senators, and others, academics, a couple Nobel laureates, uh, scientists, a lot of people from business, and especially a lot of youth voices, including Imogen, who is on this call, and uh, there are a couple other people on, on this Zoom now who are involved in the planning. And we focused especially on, um, on how there has been a link, of course, between the UNA's concern about SDGs and climate how the SDGs, of course, encompass climate change and how they're affected by climate change. One of the things that we did in for our September program is we had a declaration that was adopted uh, by 34 chapters all the way across the United States and all the chapters in California and Hawaii. It went as a petition to about 134 uh, people in Congress and the administration before the COP. And in our, in our declaration, we not only referred to the priority problems where action needs to be taken, that we wanted our US government to, and to uh, work on, but we also made reference to the Wafuna statement uh, saying that we were in agreement with this global movement. We in UNA were all working together globally as well as among our chapters. So the programs um, targeted emissions and green energy and funding and environmental justice as well as the SDGs. What we're planning now as one further step, and it's a change in April, we are planning another forum that will have will focus on high impact activities, the highest ones that will make a difference where local action can be taken. So far, everybody's been talking about, especially what, what can be done at the national level. We're concerned that you know, increasingly in every country, we've got to mobilize not only for our advocacy locally, but to take action, for example, on renewable energy, green electricity, productivity and uh, production and consumption, um, on uh, ecosystem protection, uh, all those kind of things. So we're going to have that uh, specifically where there are going to be concrete 
takeaways that everybody can work on in coalitions at their local communities, at their cities, at their state level in collaboration. And we hope to have again, uh, uh, many people who will pick up on these messages so that UNA can have a stronger voice in the solutions. We know the problems, we've got to act on the solutions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, I would like to invite, oh, I believe we have just lost Bianca. Um, Bianca, I would like to, I wanted to invite Bianca to give a closing statement, but I think we have just lost her. Um, so I suppose I will be happy to, to give closing remarks um, until Bianca returns. Um, again, thank you so much Herb, for sharing what UNAs are doing and thank you again to everyone for your questions and for contributing to a really, really thought provoking uh, discussion with your comments in the chat. Uh, we apologize for running slightly over time and thank you so much for staying with us. Um, focusing on the energy aspect of COP27 is a deeply important and topical issue affecting millions of people globally. globally. However, there's also a discrepancy in its, in its effects as shown today, varying by region and country. So in order to fully understand the crisis and to work on equitable solutions, it is critical to bring to life people's lived experiences of climate change and the energy crisis. Um, and this event has hopefully achieved this while also examining the outcomes of COP27 more generally, um, as was also previously done at our COP26 event. Um, so the discussion today provided by the speakers and our participants has served to enrich the conversation around climate change. For example, Ali made a very interesting point about how the importance for the global north to make investments in this area and that ultimately agendas for climate change need to be people centric. Um, Amid went on to speak about member states and the need to take decisive steps to mit mitigate climate change in many countries around the world, including the loss and damage fund. Um, Vladislav mentioned the need to recognize how important it is to set our own course for mitigating climate change. Um, Ray questioned, apologies for the background noise, Ray questioned whether we have the will to make the changes we need to mitigate this climate crisis um, and the discussion of climate change, including aviation and crises such as deforestation. And Himaja finally concluded um, on how we need to conductively use our privilege to ensure that young people and marginalized individuals, such as indigenous citizens, have the platform they need to be well represented. Um, the discussion also wielded some interesting points related to ensuring more young people are chosen to represent delegations and how the main challenge in the climate emergency and at COPs is the lack of enforcement, which we therefore need to work on. So ultimately, we need to incentivize people to change and push industrialized nations to cut back on fossil fuels. I hope that everyone in attendance today has been able to take away a few points that you can either action on as individuals or maybe an idea you'd like to introduce in your community or your UNA. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to keep in touch with all of you, uh, both participants and guest speakers, and continue reaching out to other civil society bodies to help those suffering more deeply from the energy crisis and climate change more broadly. Um, so I would like to suggest, if it's all right with everyone, that we take a picture since we can't be together. Um, if you do not want to be in the picture, please feel free to turn your video off. That is completely fine. If you would like to be in the picture, we invite you to turn your video on. Um, and before we take the picture, just thank you everyone for attending our event today. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you the recording and our follow-up report from the event and hope to see you at future events. Um, we are planning a youth follow-up event in the new year, come January or February, which will focus on the youth perspective on climate change. So we hope to welcome you to that event. Um, and if you would like to attend the networking event as well, which will be starting in a few minutes, then please do stay on the Zoom call. Um, I see that a few people have turned on their cameras. It's lovely. Let me just take a moment to figure out how to take a picture. Um, I know that there is a way on Zoom to do it, but if anyone knows, if they could just quickly chime in. Um... Yep, I've got it captured for us, Hannah. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much, Dorothea. L likewise. Okay, lovely. So has that, is the picture been taken? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I hope you all have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you at our next at our future events. Um, 
and our networking event as well, which will be happening now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. A great production. Yes.